So, um, I mean, Chad is a world-class teacher, and what what this what this does is help you orienting around the truth at a time where truth is being challenged. There is a lot of misconceptions and bad uh, interpretive tools being used in the modern church, and bad interpretation leads to bad theology. Bad theology leads to bad living. And so sometimes we think we're in the truth, but we're living out of old wives' tales. And I don't know about you, but old wives' tales are powerless to bring forward the kingdom realm of God. And so if we want to be powerful and effective uh, in our salvation in this hour, I really do think we need to wrestle to gain as much truth as we possibly can so that we are well balanced, we know what the truth is, we know how to handle the word of God. Because when... I'll say it this way. The last season, there has been a counterfeit spirit from the end, which is a spirit of deception. Um, it's not just Jezebel's spirit that moves over religions, but also the deceiving spirit to invoke the spirit of religion, the anti-anointing spirit that I spoke about last week. One of the consequences of that is the, the, the rise of the apostolic and the rise of the prophetic. Um, where the prophetic is not stewarded, with proper boundaries and maturity, it can become very dangerous. And one of the ways that keeps you safe is the boundaries, the pillars of the Word of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because I've, I've heard I've heard a lot of prophecy over a lot of years. I move in those circles a great deal, but I always measure everything by the Word of God, and then I come away from it, and it's not just the Word of God how my flesh interprets it but the Word of God, how the Spirit in me interprets it. Jesus says to Nicodemus, uh, you, you, flesh gives birth to flesh. And what's the point? If you're moving in the flesh, you cannot bring forward the kingdom, no matter what you think is of God. If it's not of God, it won't land. Something else is landing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but only the Spirit gives birth to the things of the Spirit. And so what, what happens is, in our, sometimes in our desire to move in the prophetic, we actually stumble into moving in the counterfeit. This is not new, all through the Old Testament. And so, and, and I spoke to Adam uh, a lot about this, and my concern was God was realigning the prophetic because the enemy will come and destroy the prophetic. Why? Because the present word of God received by you is powerful. Mm. And so what he'll do is he'll create a smokescreen, confusion, and ultimately disappointment through a misunderstanding and misuse of the prophetic realm where it's unaccountable. And what happens then is that people get so confused about nothing ever landing, they just turn off from the, the prophetic completely. And so that's how Satan works, right? He just has enough counterfeit out there that you think is genuine, that he so confuses and muddies the water that nobody knows what's what, then you, we, we quench the Holy Spirit because we despise prophecy. Does that make sense to everyone? So the prophetic is a really important tool, but it must be handled alongside the Word of God and the Spirit of God in humility and accountability. Humility and accountability. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Any measure of pride will mean your Word is the Word. Let me assure you, if the Holy Spirit is giving you a word, when you bring it to somebody else who's moving by the Spirit, they will know it's the word. They'll either give agreement to it, or they won't. Why? That is the testing program of Corinthians that is required by the body of Christ. There is no such thing as secret prophetic words. All right? And I want to lay that out now, because I don't want to go down the path of, of where I've seen tragedy because prophetic words have not been carried with maturity. And so we've got to learn how to grow in the prophetic. And there are, prof there are protocols, there's accountability, and we'll talk about those things later on. But the revelatory realm of God is part of the kingdom realm. Does everyone know what I mean by the revelatory realm? That means the Holy Spirit is speaking things to your heart through the Word of God or illuminating, expanding the Word of God to you in a way that you haven't previously understood. 
Does, it, does that make sense? So God's future operates in the present. So God is always moving from the future to the present. He's always moving from that which is fulfilled into that which needs to be fulfilled. Does that make sense? So we think linear. So we think now towards the future. God doesn't move that way. God is always fully present. God's always fully present. What does that mean? It means to God, he, he knows the beginning from the end all at once. Now, our little, little brain's not going to grasp that. It's a pretty big concept, a pretty big idea. But that means to God, he knows the beginning from the end, and he sees simultaneously the beginning and the end. And so when he speaks to you, he's gone into your future to bring it into the present and gives you an invitation to respond to that present word and he comes in and guards you from your past so that you can move in towards that future. And that's Psalm 139. So every present word of God has your future in mind and it will challenge your present understanding. Your present understanding moves basically from a limited pattern of thinking that is used to interpreting things from a fallen world perspective. That the Holy Spirit comes to you and now reveals things to you. When, when the apostles, future apostles, were with Jesus and Jesus had died and gone to the cross, he descended, he had won back the keys of authority, and he rose again. There's a spiritual, practical, historical reality to that. That's, our, that's what our faith is built on. That it wasn't just a story, it was a reality, both spiritually and practically, historically. So Jesus' death was real. It wasn't a metaphor. It was genuine. It was historically true. He genuinely died. But in his death, he overcame the last pillar of the demonic world. So he destroyed all the works of the enemy. And that is what he'd been doing since he started his ministry as the anointed of God. He was systematically bringing forward the kingdom, setting people free, bringing things back into order by moving from his anointing and his relationship with the Father. We're invited into that same reality. So by the time that Jesus rises again, he has a barbecue. See, barbecues are very holy and biblical. <laughs> He has a barbecue with, with, with the uh, disciples. And they're a bit amazed to see him. They're doubting him. And he told them he was coming back. Right? But they didn't believe him. So they got a bit of a rebuke for that, for having no faith about what he said would happen. But then he does something which is really important. You know, I've always heard this. The, the, the last words of a man who's no longer going to be with you are the most valuable words he can impart. Right? That's why the law allows a dying testimony. Did you know that? The law allows a dying testimony. You would think a dying testimony is the moment of truth for a lot of people. When, when King David was dying and he was going to impart his kingdom to his son Solomon as the son of wisdom, then he spoke to things that were precious to him that he learned to impart to his son. Why? Because he was gone. So sometimes our last words are the most powerful words. So Jesus spends 40 days talking about nothing but the kingdom. Why do you think that might be? Because he didn't know what else to talk about? No, because it was the most crucial thing of why he had come. And he wanted, he wanted the disciples to know exactly what they would do going forward. What, they, what their mission was, what their relational assignment was in every moment of every day. So for 40 days, 40 days, 40 days. How long were they in the desert? 40 days. To what? Humble them. You see, what Jesus was saying is this kingdom realm, you can't understand even on the basis of the understanding you have of being with me. You're still outsiders to the kingdom 
Although you say it. And I'm going to say something really controversial here, but you need to really grasp this. They have been baptized. They have been washed. They have believed. They have followed Jesus. But they have not yet entered into the kingdom, nor do they have the ability to understand the kingdom. So Jesus did something profound. And we often miss this. This happened before Pentecost. What did he do? He breathed on them. It's in the notes. He breathed on them. And where do we see this reality in, in, in the concept of Scripture? As we see that in, in Genesis. God put his breath, his neshema, the ha ro kadesh, his name was put into them. And it gave him life. It's what gave Adam life. On his human body. He's a, he's a spirit being, born of the spirit, and God breathed life into him, put his name into him, put his characteristic into his name, is the characteristic of God. It's his nature. So he breathed into them, explaining what he had told to Nicodemus. What did he say to Nicodemus? Nicodemus, flesh gives birth, flesh, the spirit gives birth, the spirit. You can't perceive, nor can you enter into the kingdom realm, the very son we have been forward, unless you're born again, born from above. Are you with me? So when we are born again, Jesus is bringing us into a new reality so that you can have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that understands. Eyes to see, Ears to hear and a heart that understands what? The kingdom. Because our mandate together is to bring forward as the church the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom. This often gets confused. The church is a group of spirit people in union with Christ as priest kings with a commission to bring forward that which is unseen into the seen. How do we pray? Our Father who in heaven. Can you see the Father? But you can know the Father. How? Through the person of the Holy Spirit and by looking at Jesus. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I am the perfect human incarnation of the unseen God that you call Yahweh. Think about that for a moment. I talked about this last week. The transcendent God who, they, who the Jews would not put into a name. That's why they call him Yahweh. Is manifested in Jesus. Philip, didn't you know the Father and I are one? So Jesus, through salvation, brings us into the same relational connection with him and the Father that he had with the Father through the Holy Spirit. I'll say that again. Because we really need to lay hold of this. Jesus is saying, I will go to the cross, I'll open a new and living way, my blood will be spilled, I'll cut a new covenant, it's an eternal kingdom covenant, and my blood will give you access to where you never had access before, and the Holy Spirit will come, and not only will he be upon you, but I'm anointing he'll be within you, first of all within you, then upon you. The in you is, in, is God breathing his name in you. Guess what, you're a new creation the old has gone and the new has come. How do you remember that? Your baptism. It's the visual testimony and reminder that you died to your old self life. The problem is the pattern of your thinking has to catch up to your new reality. The pattern of your thinking is built that you're the king and you're the center of your world. It's called the flesh. Right? The wrestle between understanding the kingdom and getting revelation is the revelation comes in to smash that pattern of self-preserving, self-centered, self-desiring thinking. 
Wonderful, isn't it? So that's why there's a collision. But every present word of God by revelation comes to shift you out of limitation into increase. So you have to overcome by the anointing in you the world that's in you so you can overcome the world around you. You have to overcome the world within you, which you've grown up with. You think it's your normal. And your normal is not everyone's normal. It's just your normal. Because you're unique and you've been raised in certain familial circumstances and life circumstances and cultural circumstances. But you've grown up since a little toddler thinking that is your normal. The problem is, not only is it not my normal, or anyone else's normal, it's not God's normal. So God says, okay, this is how we'll do it. Because we're all of the same family, we all have the same father, we'll all share the same values, the familial values, and we'll build together out of my truth, which is higher than the fallen world you've lived in. The problem is, there's got to be an adjustment. But it's not on God's part. It's on our part. So he loves us enough to speak into the present to go, you know that thing that you're believing? Actually, it doesn't accord with my truth. And so I'm going to give you an invitation to trust in the truth you haven't walked in beyond the truth you've always walked in and you think it's real. But actually, it's not. And am I making sense? And this happens every moment of every day. And a lot of it God does really lovingly, really graciously, and you don't know it. But then you'll have a collision. Then you'll have a storm. Then you'll have a major event in your life. And, and how does God deal with those things? He says, right here, my present word is in the middle of the storm. Remember Elijah? When he had dealt with Jezebel? You know the story of Elijah? He dealt with Jezebel, right? He did an amazing thing, didn't he? Come on, Lord, call out the fire. He even wet the, he even wet the wood. Right, what a show off. He wet the wood. Right, you guys, you're slashing your wrist. You can't even get your car. What is he, deaf? Are you, hello, are you there? Oh, Lord, your power? Where are you, you false prophets of Baal? See, Jezebel worships the false prophet of Baal. And he called out fire. My God. Got the power of God. He calls down power. And then runs for his life. Why? Because in using the anointing, he didn't understand the process. So he was running away to Mount Horeb. But he was thought he was running away from God, but actually as God had planned it, he was running to God. And an angel sees him on the way. What are you doing here? I can I just tell you, when, when an angel of the Lord or the Holy Spirit says, what are you doing here? It's not a question for them to be answered. It's a question for you to answer. Like, what are you doing, Elijah? What is going on? So fear had caused him to run away from his future, although he operated in the anointing. Are you with me? When the culture of fear accelerates, you can promise that Jezebel is somewhere in the midst. Baal is somewhere at hand. There's a false worship that's going on. And what's it designed to do? To suppress the anointed of God. Because they haven't guarded their heart in the process of their ministry. Hello? Are you with me? Let me take you forward. God speaks to him out of a place of intimacy. Puts him in the cleft of the rock. You can only see my backside, and I mean that respectfully. You can't see my face in the Elijah. Yet Moses was in a tent meeting, and he spoke with God as if face to face. So now God is talking in different ways to different people for different times, for different purposes. God's not, God's not having a monotone conversation with human form. Are you there? And you'll, some of you will say, well, I've got the word of God for the hour. That's great. Then submit it to the other people and let it be tested. 
you with me? Let it be tested. And if you're afraid of your word being tested, then there's another thing that's working, and that's called your pride. Because all of us can miss hear God because Satan parades as an angel of light. Is this too deep for you today? I, I want to tell you what's going on in the spiritual atmosphere and why you need to come back to the Word of God so powerfully and so clearly and dig into the Word and know the Word because the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And it's the Holy Spirit that expands the Word of God and gives you wisdom and understanding and brings you the true perspective so that when you talk about it with other people, you'll be able to witness in the Spirit so that something inside of them goes off. Has anyone inside got something going off with you right now as I'm talking? Is something going on inside of you where you're going, that's resonating with me? Yeah. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to be practical today. Yeah. Right? Because it, it's the practi practical reality of getting agreement that becomes spiritually powerful. See, I, 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 can, I can carry an anointing and authority and a word. But when, it, when, I, when I bring it and there's an agreement in the spirit, now there's a supernatural increase. And now if I get 10 people that in their spirit are receiving that word and agreeing with that word, now all of a sudden something's been established that I could never establish by myself. That's how the spirit realm works. Why is that important? Because you're anointed to speak and you're anointed to act in faith. You're anointed to speak God's word so that he can land on it. But he can't land on your imagination. <laughs> Are you understand me today? Why? Because I'm saying this why? Because God's got about to super accelerate the church. And we've got to come out of the last season and come into the new season. That means you've got to get on the edge of the boat like a pig. Nobody likes doing the Peter thing. Because we like to be in the boat. And we go, oh, look at the waves. Look at the sea. Look at the wind. Oh, I'm missing it. I know. We'll fix it. We'll get to the other side by rowing. We'll strain even more. We'll get it. We'll get it done. No worry, Jesus. We'll get it done. Sound familiar? I'm talking to anybody today. Sound familiar? Don't worry, Jesus. We'll get it done. What was the curse in Genesis? Working by the sweat of the... Don't worry, Jesus, we'll get it done. Oh, the wind, the waves, the storm's too big for me. And Jesus is just watching. Yeah, it is. I've been with you for a while, but you ain't learning much. See, you can, you can be with Jesus and not learn a cracker. You can open the Bible and not change Right? You can sing songs and nothing happens. That's not what we're about. There's a transforming power. And God's going to bring storms in your life, and I've experienced a few. Others are experiencing a few presently. And it's all good. Why? You've got to discern the storm because you're anointed to. You see, at the time when Peter gets out of the boat, he hasn't yet had the nation of God breathing in. He doesn't yet have understanding. He's operating on sheer present word of God faith. So let me talk to you about the power of the present word of God when it's from Jesus. You know the story, right? Jesus is praying. Now he comes on the water above the waves, which is a metaphor for the, for the world in turmoil. It's a picture of we need to understand. So it's, it's, it's trouble, it's strife, it's the disorder of the world coming against his apostles, coming against his early church, if you will. Fellowship. They're in a fellowship, right? They're rowing together to go to Bethsaida. What does Bethsaida mean? It means the house of hunting or fishing. What does that mean? That means the house of increase. So they've left one place and they're going to the house of increase but what separates them is a storm. Hello. Who's in a storm? You're in God's growth strategy. So exciting, isn't it? You see, in God's growth strategy, you can keep straining at the oars and you can keep doing it in your own strength how you think 
it should be done and how you've always done it, right? Or you can be like Peter, who knew that which he's looking at was foreign, but he knew something in him that he recognised. Speak to me and tell me to come to you. Now, you, you think of that for five seconds in the middle of a storm. You're surrounded by everyone that's screaming and yelling, I suspect, straining of the oars, Oh, we're not going to get down to the seas. I can't believe it. Every voice of negativity and fear is flowing out. Now they see what appears to be ghosts. This is the same group that had been with Jesus just hours before, but they didn't recognize him. Why? Because Jesus doesn't come the way you're used to him in the middle of the storm. He comes in the way that's needed. Are you with me? He comes in the way that you need him to come. And he will test your present faith and he will test your present understanding to bring you into increase. That's the whole idea. Are you still tracking with me? So what does Peter do? He takes the present word of God and acts upon it. Now I need to explain what the present word of God is. It is the word of God brought forward by his authority, his spirit, his anointing, and the power to achieve the very thing he said came out of his mouth. Isaiah 55 tells us that God's present word has a purpose and a destination. When Peter receives it to his heart, he's received the authority of God, the anointing of God, and God's faith that he adds to. And he gets out of the boat and starts to live above the circumstances, literally walking on the water. But what happens is he becomes overwhelmed by the world around him, not the living word before him. You see, it's not enough that you hear the present word and respond. You've got to keep taking the small steps to the destination. Does that make sense? So faith is required in every step not just the initial step. It's required in every step. And along the way, the circumstance will want to buffer you. The circumstances will activate the things of what you presently know. And, and when you look at the waves and you look at the things around you, you'll go, this is impossible. And guess what happened to his pain? Fear overwhelmed him. Fear is the strategy of a fallen world to keep you out of your faith ability in Christ. Fear is the currency of hell, not heaven. And perfect love casts out all fear. So we're in a climate at the moment where there's storms and fear. Jesus, Jesus called Peter, but Peter had to find the audience of his voice amongst all that he knew all of his mates, and all of the conversation. He had to separate his heart from what was going on around him, even though he was in the church. That is what's happening in the present day, even in the church. Ours is not a spirit of fear. We've got a sound mind in Christ. And you can't do that except by the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to bring them and they'd be born again to open up their mind. So every time I go back to the go back to fear, I go back to the flesh that limits the faith response for the increase that's at hand. Am I making sense to you, right? So why is this important? Because when you realize that the present word of God will bring you an anointing into a situation where you can achieve the impossible then the anointing that rests on you, how much more? That brings me to Pentecost. Now, if you go to Pentecost, it's pretty interesting. And I know a lot of different denominations interpret Pentecost a number of different ways. And I want to be very respectful about this. But if the disciples have already been born again, that were with Jesus talking about the kingdom for 40 days, Pentecost was not about their being born again or their salvation. It was about receiving power from the time. So let's let's go 
to the text. Israel had a history against political forces. All through the Old Testament we see Israel raging against nations and nations raging against Israel. Why? Because Paul says, first in the natural, then in the spiritual. So there's something in the natural that's pointing to a spiritual truth. But once Jesus comes, the spiritual becomes higher than the natural. There's, a, there's an interplay there. Does that make sense? So in, in the Old Testament, what do we see? We see the ites. All the ites are fighting against Israel. It's a practical, physical, geographical war. And when King David is given um, the ability to have the kingdom, it's a political kingdom. But it's built from the presence of God, revealing the wisdom of God, which the Solomon reveals. When, when the kingdom is removed, it is when the kingdom is built spiritually, even in a political system, it transcends the political culture of the day. It's above it. So therefore, anything we build in the spirit has to be built in the spirit first, so it can then put into practical reality. The Queen of Sheba did not have her breath taken away by the glory presence of God in the temple, but by the wisdom of God revealed in the administration of all that, that Solomon did. Now think about that. Is God a God of excellence? Yeah. And can your excellence in your workplace, using the wisdom of God that's spirit-led, cause others to go, wow, yeah, who gets the glory? Him. Why? It's part of your anointing. It's part of who you are. It's part of being led by the Spirit to do everything as unto the Lord. Okay? So I'm not talking about perfectionism. That's, that's a heavy yoke. I'm talking about being led by the Spirit and giving yourself to get the skills, time, and attention that is needed to what God's asked you to do. That is as much the, the kingdom manifesting as moving in signs, wonders, and miracles. And somehow we've lost that and understanding because we overemphasize something. So what's going on then on the day of Pentecost? Well, the disciples go to Jesus saying, hey, are you now going to bring forward your political kingdom? going to kick Rome's butt. Fantastic. We're going to kick Rome's butt. We're going, to, we're going to turn the political system upside down. And Jesus says, no, not for you to know the hour, the time of our Father's time. In other words, there is a time and that's going to happen, but that's not today. Do you get what I'm saying prophetically? In the book of Revelation, I've talked about this previously. Jesus only came with one message. Get yourself aligned with me. Because you know what? If you read on in the book of Revelation, Babylon destroys Babylon. It implodes. All you have to worry about is your kingdom alignment and your anointing to bring forward the kingdom. Focus on that. Let me do everything else. Father's got it covered. Am I making sense? Is this encouraging for you this morning, or this afternoon? Because when, when they get there, this is what Jesus said to them. Jesus instructed them, don't leave home without it. Now he said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait until you receive the gift I told you about, the gift the Father promised. For John baptized you in water, so they've been baptized in repentance. But in a few days from now, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, the baptism is important. And then he goes on, he says, every time they were gathered together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is the time now for you to free Israel and restore our political kingdom? He answered, the Father is the one who sets the fixed times and times of their fulfillment. You are not permitted to know the timing of all that. He is prepared by his own authority. But I promise you this, don't get caught up in the political, don't worry about that. But here's what I want you to focus on. I've just been talking to you about the kingdom for 40 days. That's what's really important. Now, get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It won't save you. It's not a sign of you being saved. It's a sign of the inauguration. 
that I have touched the mercy seat of heaven, that I am enthroned and you are part of me on earth and you receive power from on high to do the very things I've called you to do. The church was birthed in power for purpose. When we get that misunderstood, we change our mission. And we change God's purpose for our life. Does that make sense? We have to understand that when we receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's the anointing of God. So two couple of things happen that we need to talk about. In Babel, what did God do with language? He confused it so that he scattered the nations. Why? Because their unity under Nimrod, a counterfeit, could achieve anything. They were building a ziggurat, a temple to bring down the gods, the Elohim, that God had put over the nations. They wanted to bring down and worship the lesser gods. So God said, there's no, no, no limitation of what man can do in unity. Think about that. Even under the counterfeit. So I'm going to scatter them. But now we see an inauguration. We've seen the dove come back and land on Jesus. We've now seen a process. Now we see the Holy Spirit come as fire, tongues of fire upon those who are in the upper room. The sign of the inauguration was twofold. One, they were intoxicated with God. Full of the Spirit looked like they were drinking scotch at 10 a.m. Now, if you're that all over the place, you're barely going to learn a new tongue to speak the languages that God had scattered because they are all now in Jerusalem for a feast. The, the inauguration meant I'm now gathering all the nations through you as my anointed Matthew 28, 18 has begun today in power. That mandate doesn't finish until Jesus comes back. We cannot have another inauguration by definition. Jesus' ministry was inaugurated by a dove, something like a dove is dead in money. The church's inauguration was something like tongues of fire manifesting them so intoxicated they couldn't stand up they weren't slurring their words in other languages. They were given a supernatural ability to speak other languages. Now, this same inauguration is not just for the Jews. It now goes to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. But now the power of God moves differently. It doesn't move by tongues of fire. It cascades over the congregation. So when we, when we get a little bit um, religious in our thinking, we'll say, oh, it can't be a very good movie because we didn't have tongues of fire. Well, we are not, we're not replicating the inauguration. The ongoing work is the cascading, it's the flow, it's, it, it's the landing on. But you know when you're baptised in the Holy Spirit, and we see the same phenomena there is speaking supernatural languages. That is not your heavenly tongue. It's not the tongues of angels. It's the language of nations. There's a massive difference. So when we say, oh, the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, and we go back to those scriptures, then we need to interpret what the glossy are, are actually. They're actually the mission plan of God to bring all people to Christ. That we're speaking supernaturally in their language. So we're able to communicate under the anointing towards them to bring the gospel, the good news to them. Does that make sense? And we see also that you can have more than one filling of the Holy Spirit. What happens when the religious elite now come against the apostles? They were, they were all, they had tons of fire going on. They had it all going on. A little bit tipsy, a little bit, how's your father? but speaking in these languages of nations, and now the opposition comes, the religious elite comes, and this is important. 
That spirit is the anti-anointing spirit first manifested. It's the anti-Christ spirit. Right? And they come and they question these guys. Who are you guys? You haven't been through the religious procedures. What are you guys doing? But they recognize these ordinary people have been with Jesus. Something about being with Jesus, just quietly. So they give him a bit of a flogging. Gamaliel talks sense to them, off they go. They go back to their to the church and they have a prayer meeting and they praise God. When's the last time you praised God for getting a bit of a flogging from the religious elite? Why? They start with Psalm 2. And this is instrumental. This is the foundation of the point I'm making. Why do they pray Psalm 2? Because they recognize the power that the Pharisees and the elite are operating on is not God. You can be religiously zealous and moved by the wrong spirit. Are you there? Yeah. They pray Psalm 2. They war in the heavens. And basically, the kings of the earth are planning against your anointed. Jesus is in heaven. Who's the anointed now? The church. Every believer. They're warring against us. So please remove them, Jesus. Please take them out. Isn't that how we pray? Please remove the opposition. Please remove that demon spirit. Please remove that person. Please remove Jezebel. Please resume. We, we need to cast that person out. Isn't it? That? That's how we use it in charismatic church. Right? You couldn't be more wrong. It's not what they prayed. Father, extend your hand and give us more power to preach the truth even more boldly. With the intimidation and the fear and the threat, let us become even more bold to preach your truth, to bring forward that which you taught us, to reveal and bring forward the kingdom, because that's what we're living for. Give us more anointing. Don't take the opposition away. We weren't the first time. Give us anointing. What does the church need right now? More anointing for courageous faith. It needs to get before the Lord and say, Lord, I've been battered and I've been bruised and I've been intimidated. But Lord, you're using it all for good for my increase because you're going to get me to the other side. I want you in my boat. I want you in my presence. I'm going to yield myself to you to get me more anointing. Because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Not you straining at the oars. Not you engaging flesh to flesh. Are you with me today? Because this is the shift we're coming into prophetically. Am I making sense? Has this resonated with any of you today? Then what do we do? This is the hard part of the journey. If you don't recognize your strain at the oars, you'll need a storm to work it out. Right? So it's better to stop straining at the oars and yield yourself now to Christ, the life that's in you and the life that's upon you. So God can give you a present word for you to get out of the boat of where you've been to where you should be going. And when you do that, what will happen is you'll create the breakthrough for everyone else around you. Does that make sense? When Peter got hold of Jesus and Jesus got hold of Peter, he brought him into the boat and they got the other side like that. See, you can do it all in your own strength which is what religion teaches us. That's all right, God, I just, I'll give you a bit of a hand. God doesn't need a hand. He needs your faith, loving submission to his present word to become bold and courageous in this hour and go and live the very life he's called us to live. You know why? Because when you do that, you'll shift the atmosphere around you. You'll shift the relationships in your life. You will quieten the fear by not entertaining it. Hello? Yeah. All right. I'm going to have some communion. Let me just pray for a moment. Just help me with this because this is an activation time, church. Um, 
Some of you heard before, some of you maybe knew. He was mildly challenged today. Yeah. Okay. Who has some revelation they can go home with? Yeah. Right. God is a God of growth and increase, not limitation. The limitation in our life is never on God's part. Does that make sense? And so we're caught, we're not earning anything, we're stewarding towards increase, what God is bringing us into increase. And it means some of our understanding and some of the foundations that we built into may have to give way to what God's now saying to us. He doesn't drop the truth on you like a bomb and go see how you cope. He is loving, he is caring, he's a father, and he teaches you step by step. If you don't want to take the step, he won't make you. His desire is that you will. His love attention to you is will because he wants to bring you to maturity. That's what he's doing. That's what the Holy Spirit is there for. But if you don't want to take that step, God won't make you. He'll encourage you. He'll use things around you. But at the end of the day, he will not mess with your free will. The question is, where do you want to be found? Do you want to be found moving with him, walking with the Spirit? Or do you want to be found digging in in the world? Do you understand what I'm saying? And I don't get to choose that for you. I only get to choose it for me. You get to choose it because that, that's what makes you powerful. You get to exercise your free will as led by the Holy Spirit. And that's what makes you powerful. Here's where the power of God and the gospel hits you. That first base step. That's where the power is. If I'm still sitting in the boat, I can have all the power of the world. It's available. But I haven't used it. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, in, in our teaching, we've become more conceptual than practical. The power of God hits the pavement when you do. The moment you take that faith action, that's where the power of God is, right there. Amen? And it looks like overcoming. You know, all, all through the churches and, and when he's got, that he's got in his hand of revelation, to he who overcomes, I'll give. Your increase is in your overcoming. So we're just going to take communion because there's something about the reality of us being in Christ, not just individually, but together. We are together in one Godhead. Together, we are all baptized into Christ. We all have union to Christ. If I was to put Christ up there and a string leading up there, then you would see we're all joined to the one same Jesus. Now the difficulty is not the reality from Jesus' point of view. The difficulty is from our point of view where we look at our brother and sister and go, well you're not in Jesus because I see the way you're behaving. Well, we might say that back to each other, right? Now we all in Christ, and we all have the Holy Spirit. It's what we give ourselves to that empowers us. Does that make sense? So we're all on a journey. That's why we do this together, because we're all on a journey of dismantling the thinking of the world to embrace the thinking of God in the world. Make sense? All right. Now I want you to do business with Jesus. Because there's power in this testimony. Jesus said he won't take this meal again until we're in heaven with him as his bride. This is a foreshadowing of an eternal fulfillment. And every time we do this, this is a table of friendship. It's a table of intimacy. It's a table of oneness. It's a table of eternal hope. Our anchor is Jesus in a world that is going in a million directions very quickly. The world will shake, but the kingdom never will. It's an unshakable kingdom. It's an unshakable hope. It's an unshakable step-by-step faith. So as you take it, do the business that you need to do with Jesus today. What is it that you're struggling with? What is it that you need 
faithful? What is it that you want to see him overcome in you? What is it this union, this testimony of your union with him will empower you in? I'll just give you a moment to do that. If you need healing, there's healing in communion. If you need provision, there's provision in communion. If you need peace, <laughs> there's peace in communion. If you need to know the love of God, there's the love of God in communion. Jesus is our all sufficiency. You know, when we first started to meet in Johnny and, and Ruth's home earlier this year, I said, what does it look like if everything was stripped away? And Jesus was, all you had, would that be enough for you? How's that process coming? It's not a nice thought in one way, but then you start to realize where you would be found. Put your faith in the system, it's not going to be there. You put your faith in things that are going to burn. They're wood, they're hay, they're stubble. They're nice for a season. But if they're your crutch, they're your limitation. There's something profound God's doing. It's beyond me. And I'm grateful for that. That we're all getting drawn into. And what we talk about has to become a reality. Because right now we're in a spiritual battle where things are ramping up. Spirit of heaven wherever I go. And I promise you that God will lead us to hard places. Because that's where the light needs to shine the most. He'll lead us to difficult situations that He's prepared for you and anointed you for. Paul the Apostle says, let your words be seasoned with grace. Your words become life to one another. Wherever you go, let your actions reveal heaven. Wherever you go, let your heart be the heart of the Father. Whatever you do, and let Him be all in all. Let Him get His glory in you and through you. One day in our maturity, as we work towards this massive vision, we can set up Jesus. So that didn't you know the Father and I are one? All these things I'm doing are coming from Him living in me. You see, that is the ultimate sign of maturity. Thank you.
Help us with our relationships and our friendships, Lord. Help us in our marriages and our home life. Help us keep the bond of unity and the bond of peace. Help us to be for each other, to hear each other, to empower each other, and to build together. We just pray, Lord, that you will work in us and through us in extraordinary ways that we never, ever thought was possible. Because we love you and we trust you at your word. We became flesh. Lord, I pray a blessing over everyone that watches this video. Everyone that's here today, Lord, protect them, empower them. Let them know your love in a more intimate way. Let them know your truth, your heart, and your ways in all of their ways. In Jesus' name. Amen.